In the past few months, fear has gripped our nation in a new and unexpected way. Our society has been rocked. People are uncertain and afraid. But it's not just a collective fear. This pandemic and the resulting economic crisis has also resulted in personal fears. Am I going to get sick? What about my kids? What about my aging parents? How do we stay safe? Is the economy going to recover? When? What if I lose my job? What if I never regain my job? Will my friends still be my friends when this is over? Will they even remember me? Am I safe at my job? Are my kids safe at daycare? Am I safe going to the grocery store? What's the governor going to say today? Is this ever going to be over? If so, what is our world going to look like when it is? Some of you have been separated from family and unable to travel. Others of you have been quarantined. Still, still others are waiting for a result from a test. There are a lot of reasons to fear. It, it seems like over the years, every time I talk about fear, someone then sends me an acrostic. Fear. False evidence appearing real. You know, I guess on some level that can be true. However, that is an amazing oversimplification of the subject and only half true because many times fear is based on real evidence. When you have a real enemy coming after you, that's not false evidence. When you're diagnosed with COVID-19, there's nothing false about that. If you're in danger of losing a family member, short, pithy acrostics don't bring peace or comfort. There, there has to be something more than that. Fear is a powerful emotion that can cause you to run or fight or scream or sometimes just shut down. In many cases, you can't control that immediate reaction. If you have a phobia, coming in contact with the object of your phobia can create a stress trigger for different types of physiological responses. I might even react worse than that if I, if I opened my hood and there was a snake. Physiological responses to fear can manifest in many ways. Uh, shaking, sweating, nausea, dry mouth, faster breathing, heart palpitation, panic attacks, dizziness. And then those responses can make you even more afraid. Now... Let me switch to some good news. Fear is not weakness. You've probably got someone in your life who mans up and says, well, I'm not afraid of anything. Yeah, other than the fact that they're afraid to admit they have fear. Fear is not sin. The Bible is filled with stories of great men and women of God who face fear. And God said to them, fear not, not as an admonishment, but as an encouragement. Fear is not new. We find fear in the very first book of the Bible. From almost the beginning of time, man has dealt with fear. Now, well, it's true that you can't control fear or when it strikes. It is also true that the follower of Jesus does not have to be controlled by fear. The passage we look at today talks about fear and includes a powerful promise from the Lord. Almost exactly 19 years ago, I was going through a very uncertain time in life and ministry. I was being criticized and unfairly attacked. My future was uncertain. 
I didn't want to fear, but it was almost overwhelming. For weeks, I woke up in the middle of the night, my mind racing with all the things that might happen. I, I worried for hours, unable to go back to sleep. In the middle of that season, the Lord gave me a strategy. I re read and reread the first 32 Psalms just over and over. I wrote down key verses on three by five cards and put them in my nightstand. And before I went to bed, and also when I woke up in the middle of the night, I read through the verses. I memorized many of them through countless repetition. Here's one of my favorites. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. If you'd like a copy of these cards, you can download it. FirstNLR.com slash promises. The psalm we look at today is one of the passages that brought me considerable comfort. If you're struggling with fear, I want you to listen close. And I encourage you to write out this psalm and to read it every time you're afraid. This psalm was written by David, who knew what it meant to face fear. When David was anointed as king of Israel, the current king, King Saul, tried to kill him. David ran for his life and hid. David faced countless enemies who were intent on destroying him. And at some point in his life, David looked back and wrote this song. Scholars call this a psalm of confidence. That's the kind of song I want to sing. Psalm 27, starting with verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is your light. He brings light to the darkness and lights your path. The Lord is your salvation. He gives you victory over your enemies, regardless of the odds. Because God Almighty is on your side. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? We could probably just stop right there and celebrate. But that's just verse 1 in this, in this incredible song. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord doesn't just save you. He keeps you. You're above the fray and out of reach. You're protected by God. You don't have to leave the safety of his stronghold. And don't you dare do it. When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. God will cause your enemies to make mistakes and get confused. And now verse 3 is one of my favorites. This is one of the scriptures I memorize. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. The size of the enemy doesn't shape my confidence because God is greater. The amount of conflict doesn't have to shake your confidence because God is greater. It may look like the odds are stacked against you, but God is on your side. And then David pivots. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. And what you expect is, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I might always be healthy and strong. Or that I might always be wealthy. That I might be a great man of great knowledge and wisdom. That I might always be king. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But that's not what David longed for. That's not what mattered most. Instead, David said, this is it. This is the most important thing. This is the answer to my problems, my fears, my challenges. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. David was not meaning I want to live at church. Instead, hear it this way. There's nothing I want more than the Lord's presence. If I can only have one thing in this world, it's his presence. No matter what comes my way, I want to face it with Jesus. I want to know that I am with him and he is with me. There is absolutely nothing like the presence of the Lord. I long for it. I need it. I desire it. I seek it. It's interesting. Some of the most precious and powerful times of worship I've experienced 
have been in seasons of fear and doubt, uncertainty, opposition. We found out on Friday, March 13th, that we would no longer be able to meet in the church building, but would be online only. Although that was somewhat of a surprise to us, we'd been studying, knew it was coming. The day was a surprise. It wasn't a surprise to God. Months before we had even heard of coronavirus, God arranged our messages to be exactly what we would need in this time. We didn't have to change our plans because our plan was obviously his plan. Pastor Brad and I talked. We decided we'd do a special Connect with God worship service that Sunday night. And we, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't have a clue uh, how many or who might join us. Neither of us had ever led worship in an empty room, and that's way more intimidating than leading worship in front of a crowd. And that night, to our surprise, thousands joined online to worship and to pray together. so powerful we did it again the next week and the next week and the next week it was crazy what happened it just kept growing and people all over the world worshiped with us there may not have been people in this room but let me tell you this room was not empty it was filled with the presence of the lord i think the moment that i i will never forget was the end of the second week and we thought the cameras were off and the service was done. But we just kept worshiping because it, just the presence of the Lord was so strong. I was just lying face down on the platform, weeping in his presence. We sang spontaneous worship and we felt covered by his glory. And later we found out the cameras were still on and that thousands of you experienced that same powerful presence in your home. Together, we learned what David learned. Our worst days are our best days in his presence. There's nothing like the presence of the Lord. In times of stress and fear and distress, run to the presence of the Lord. David wrote, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And now here's the promise, verse 5. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle, and he will set me high upon a rock. Hallelujah. Isn't that a great promise? I love it. I was writing this message on a, a day where I was overwhelmed with fear. I stopped right here, and I began to thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you hide me in the shelter of your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you set me high on a rock where I'm safe from enemies and surrounded by you. Thank you, Jesus, for your saving and your keeping and your protecting power. And now I want to walk through the promise with you. For in the day of trouble, David was not talking about a little trouble. This was not locking your keys in your car trouble or losing your phone trouble or making a D on a test trouble. This was coronavirus. Is my business going to survive? Do we have enough to eat? Am I going to make it trouble? Thank God. God can handle the big stuff. And David knew what big trouble was. Evil, wicked, pagan kings and their armies were trying to kill him. This promise was written for house on fire, don't know what to do or where to turn, trying to survive kind of trouble. David said, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe. The dictionary definition of safe is secure from harm, injury, danger, or risk. 
When big trouble comes, God will keep you safe from danger or harm. He will protect you and watch over you. Now, here's what I think is really cool. The word David used for safe meant more than just safe. It also meant concealed or hidden. You are hidden in God. You are hidden in the presence of the Lord. When enemies come looking for you, when Satan comes to attack, they see the Lord, but they don't see you. You are not hidden from them. You are hidden in him. And that's the safest place you can be, hidden in his presence. Picture it this way. Picture a mom with her small child. They're going to the doctor's office in a driving rainstorm. When they park and get ready to go in the building, what does mom do? She wraps her baby up to protect him from the rain. And then without regard for her own comfort, she cradles her son in her arms. You've seen this. She, she holds him close, and then she leans down to further protect him from the wind and rain. And surrounded by his mom, he's safe from the storm. Mom gets soaked, but the baby is safe, warm, and dry. What a beautiful picture of the love and protection of your heavenly father. God holds you tight closely to his chest and he carries you through the storm of why the one thing David asked of the Lord was to dwell in his presence. Even while he's being hunted by men who are trying to kill him, David knew he was safe, secure, and protected in the presence of the Lord. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe or hidden in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle. David used two different words to talk about being hidden. It was obviously an important concept if he mentioned it twice in the span of one promise. And it's what makes this promise really special. When you think hide, you think about hiding because of fear. But in this case, God isn't hiding you because he can't take care of you. Instead, he is sheltering. He is protecting. He is preserving you from harm. Hidden in God, you are safe and protected. For in the day of trouble, he will keep you safe in his dwelling. He will hide you in the shelter of his tabernacle. And then here, one more thing. He'll set you high on a rock. Another translation says it this way. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. In Bible times, there were no planes, missiles, or later guided bombs. Instead, an enemy attacked with overwhelming force. But if you occupied the high ground, a small force could hold off a large army. The enemy's focus was on trying to scale the mountain. They couldn't carry protective gear. And so when the army tried to advance, they were vulnerable to attack from above. The higher a fortress or palace was located, the safer it was. That is what God does for you. He places you in a high place out of reach of your enemies. You are on the highest ground. You are set on God as your rock and your fortress. This verse demonstrates just how precious you are to God. What do you do with something that's precious to you? You put it on a high shelf where no one can reach it, where it will be safe. You are precious to God. You are hidden in God and elevated by God. You are safe and secure. That's why David could write and sing, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. And the 27th Psalm ends with these words. I am still confident of this. This is a good promise. This is something good to stand on today. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart and wait for the Lord. The result of seeking God's presence is that you are with him, safe 
forever. Enemies and trouble lose their power and impact on your life because you are safe, covered, hidden, protected by him. His presence renders the powers of trouble useless. What a beautiful promise to memorize. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high on a rock. Lord, we come to you today in Jesus' name. I pray right now for people who are struggling with fear, who feel overwhelmed. Lord, it seems like every time they turn on the TV or every time they open Facebook, there's, there's more bad news, and it's, it's just pressing, and it, it, it seems to be occupying. Lord, we, we flee the fear, and instead, we run to your presence. Lord, let our reaction to fear be driven by the desire to be with you, to be in your presence, to be in your tabernacle. And then, God, I pray that you would cover us, surround us, protect us, hold us, elevate us, insulate us, guard us, and guide us. Lord, we confess the fear. We give it to you, and we thank you that you've promised that you would be with us in the fear. Lord, we thank you for the promise that in our day of trouble, you will keep us safe in your dwelling. You will hide us in the shelter of your tabernacle and set us high upon a rock. Lord, every time fear creeps back in, let it, let it propel us to your presence. I pray for peace for your people today and for confidence. Let us be surrounded by you. Lord, we pray what David prayed. One thing we ask of you. One thing we seek, that we may dwell in your house and be surrounded by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.